Subject, Ship Hedulina. Species, Uracari. Description, Reptilian humanoid, no tail. 5 and 3 inches, 1.6 m. AVG height, 135 pounds, 61 kilograms. AVG weight, 105 year life expectancy. Ship, RSV Lolana, fights with honor. Location unknown. Our ship had taken a beating, and nobody can tell me where we are. Our nav officer is down and probably isn't going to survive his wounds. My second was already dead, head smashed in by a console detaching when we were hit by the first missile salvo. My own head was reeling from the successive slipspace jumps we had just made. The first jump was to arrive at our destination, and the second was to escape the ambush that had awaited us. The second one was the problem. It had been done out of desperation. We had jumped blind and without shields. We have multiple hull breaches, our faster than light drive is offline, and our engines are not responding, sir. The panic in the voice of Luna, my head of engineering, was palpable. Evacuate and seal the breached sectors. Initiate distress protocol and try to find out where we are. I managed to say through gritted teeth. This was supposed to be a simple scouting mission. Some warp irregularities that we were supposed to scan and report back on. Our shields didn't even have a chance to spool up before we had been fired on by the Omni Union bastards. We had been hit hard, and the additional strain of an unshielded warp likely caused even more damage. Sir, the ship that hit us was a destroyer class, my intel officer Crean informed me. There's no way they were there by chance. That's not good, I replied. We need to inform the Republic as soon as we can. Speaking of which, where are we on a location? Crean grimaced. Judging from our flight path, we're far beyond our borders. That's also not good. Well, we're also outside of the Hoyu's borders, so it could be worse. Probably. I'll have more info when our sensors come back online. Jumping unshielded, desynchronized them. Crin frowned as she glanced at the nav panel across the bridge. My nav officer, Cran, had been taken to the medbay. Crean and Cran were hatchmates, siblings that burst into the world simultaneously. It's said that they have an unshakable bond, and as far as I've seen, that holds up. The odds of both of them being assigned to the same ship were slim to none, but they somehow made it happen. Their playful banter made the long treks into deep space less exhausting. I hope Kron makes it. His quick thinking had saved us. He had already calculated a blind jump by the time I gave the order. Lena interrupted my chain of thought. Shiphead, I have a more comprehensive damage report. Let's hear it. We're in a bad way. We have hull breaches in engineering, life support, and the living quarters. These areas have been sealed off until we can enact repairs. But that will require a spacewalk. Lena grimaced. We've lost a lot of gas. And the pressurized reserves might not be enough to fully repressurize those sectors. Understood. As long as we don't have leaks, you can take your time formulating a plan. Not too long, though, or we'll run out of rations. I smiled at my little joke. Lena didn't. We also have no propulsion or shields. Sublights and our FTLD are non-responsive and vacuum exposed. I wouldn't be surprised if we were leaking radiation, but I can't confirm that without our sensors. Our shields are non-functional and our frame is damaged. We're going to need at least dry dock for full repairs, but I think it's likely that the ship is totaled. This was far from the Loalania's maiden voyage. I had been the shiphead for 12 years, but the ship had been in service for at least 30. She had started life as a corvette, but is now classified as a frigate. Relatively small for a warship, but faster than most and could pack a punch, as long as we got a swing in, at least. The Loalana could fit a crew of up to 50, but operated best with a smaller crew. We had departed with a crew of 38, including myself. What's our casualties look like? I said, no longer smiling. Lena looked down at his data pad solemnly. Six dead, 10 critically injured, four unaccounted for. 20 casualties, my hearts sank, more than half my crew out of action and more than a quarter of them dead or MIA. I felt myself spiraling and shook myself out of it. Half is better than all. Keep me updated on the status of the injured and missing. I'll notify the next of kin when we're rescued. Speaking of which, how's the distress signal doing? It's beeping away, shiphead, Crean said, and our sensors just came back online. We are definitely leaking radiation Luna. Anyways, I can pinpoint where we are now. Hopefully there's an exploration team within sensor range. The odds of that were low. Ever since the war with the Omni Union had began, the Republic had been more focused on manning warships than exploring the cosmos. For good reason, though, the war hadn't been going in our favor. It seemed like for every OU ship we took out, another three took their place. We'd managed to keep them out of the core systems, but we were firmly on the defensive. Ah, I spoke too soon, Crean sighed. We're well out of range of anything Republic. 
No known life this far out. Looks like we're smack in the middle of a solar system, though. Maybe we can get some supplies for repairs. Let's see. A yellow dwarf sun. Eight planets. Oh, four of them are gas giants. No worries about repressurization. I smiled sadly. That's good. Hopefully we can get what we need to limp back to Repo. Fuck! Crane interrupted me. Shiphead, this solar system is inhabited. What? What? Crane looked up at me. I'm showing signs of advanced colonization on two planets and several moons. Actually, one of the planets looked like a capital world. The entire surface is covered in artificial structures. Also, there are a proximity alarm pinged. The first two notes were the same for every ship that approached. The second two determined if it was friend, foe, or unknown. In my 12 years of being shiphead, I had never heard these last two notes. Unknown. Lena rushed back to his console. Unknown vessel on approach, Kryn said, baffled. It's absolutely massive. Easily twice the size of any battleship I've ever seen. It has shields powered up, but doesn't appear to have its weapons armed. Not that we'd necessarily be able to tell, Lena said fearfully. I sat up straight and asked, <laughs> are comms online? Yes, sir. Hail them? They're hailing us, sir, Lena said. Do you want me to put them through? I nodded and Lena set to work, opening a channel. The sounds that came through our speakers were nonsensical and guttural. I looked at Lena in confusion. The channel's working. We'll need a minute for the translator to take effect, he explained. The next noise I heard nearly sent me into an early grave from shock. No need for that. We've scanned your logs and extrapolated your language. I am Captain Reynolds of the USS Thanatos. You seem to be in a spot of bother. May we assist? Asked the voice from the speaker. It took me a second to remember how to speak. I am Shiphead Ulina of the RSV Loalana. We come in peace and are in no position to turn down an offer of aid. It shall be done. Prepare to be boarded and welcome to Seoul. Subject, Shiphead Ulina. Species, Urakari. Description, reptilian humanoid. No tail. Five and three inches, 1.6 M, AVG height. 135 pounds, 61 kilograms, AVG weight. 105 year life expectancy. Ship, RSV Loalana, fights with honor. Location, Seoul. The bridge was silent as we all watched the holographic display of the massive ship that had come to our rescue. The armor plating of the ship gave it the shape of driftwood, or something an artist would try to create with driftwood before they gave up on part of the way through. Flat, semi-round, and very, very thick plates covered almost the entirety of the vessel, with the exception of a few spots. It took me some time to realize that those spots were likely weapon ports, or maybe even fighter bays. There were four obvious weapons, two at the top and two at the bottom, pointing in separate directions. Judging from the shape, they had to be some sort of magnetically accelerated cannon. They were bigger than the Lolana. Sir, part of the unknown vessel's opening up and something is detaching from the interior, Crin informed me in a voice just above a whisper. It looks like it's another ship, a ship that was a little larger than our own, separated from the unknown vessel and positioned itself alongside the Loalana. An even smaller ship then left that one and began a course for us. We're being hailed by the small vessel, Lena croaked, struggling to find his voice. I cleared my throat and said, put them through. The speaker crackled to life, and the voice on the other end said, RSV Loalana, this is Lieutenant Sergei Babanin of the USS Valor. Please respond. We're here, Lieutenant Sergei Babanin of the USS Valor. I am Shiphead Ulina, and this is the RSV Loalana. You have permission to come aboard, I said, trying to mask the tension in my voice. This was the worst case scenario for a first contact from a species outside of the Republic. Indebting ourselves at first contact is definitely going to have some political backlash, especially with some of the more xenophobic member species. You would think that going to war would be, but being indebted to someone you don't know is usually a lose-lose scenario. Either we're out something by repaying the debt, or we don't repay the debt and go to war anyway. Uh, well, Lieutenant Babanin began hesitantly. We're not quite ready for boarding yet. We're showing several hull breaches and your structural integrity is, well, our frame is damaged, we know. It's not just damaged, Captain, or shiphead. It's cracked. Your frame is being held together by your hull and your hull has holes in it. If we're not extremely precise with our docking maneuver, you're going to fall to bits. I gave Lena a bewildered look. He returned my stare with one of his own before looking back at his instrument panel. By the suns, he's right. Apologies, shiphead. The damage is much more severe than we originally assessed, he said. What can we do? I asked, trying not to sound panicked. 
I don't want to lose any more of my crew. I, I don't know, Lena said, nearly losing his composure. Don't worry too much, shiphead. We're going to be able to extract you, Lieutenant Babanin interjected. We are just going to need precision guidance. We're downloading the software required right now. Do you have compatible docking equipment, clamps and such, I asked. Well, we're currently waiting for the download to finish to solidify our plan of action, but I think our best bet is to use an umbilical. Looking at your ship's layout and the holes in it, we can probably attach to the hole in your, I think that's your living quarters. It's the room near your bridge. I did some mental mapping. Yes, that's right. That area is sealed off due to depressurization, though. That won't be a problem, Lieutenant Babanin said cheerily. We've brought enough gas to repressurize your entire ship. Once we're attached and the room is repressurized, you'll be able to unseal it and exit through the umbilical. The plan was solid, but one thing bothered me. If you're going to be using an umbilical, then why do you need precision guidance software? We're not familiar with your ship's construction methods or composition, he began. For all we know, just getting close to your ship can cause it to break apart due to the forces generated by our proximity. We'll need to be in a position far enough away that we won't be affecting you. Aim and guide the umbilical to the proper position and fire it gently enough that it won't send a shockwave that will shatter your ship. Understood, I said, satisfied by the explanation. All right, do you have pressure suits available, he asked. Lena shook his head and said, we don't have pressure suits, but we do have respirators. They won't last long if we're exposed to vacuum, though. Well, that's better than nothing. I suggest you prep them. We'll be in touch when we're ready to begin. Acknowledged. Shiphead Olina, out. The comms light winked out as the connection was severed. The crew sat in silence for a time, unsure of what to say. Something was bothering me about that interaction, but I couldn't quite place it. It was Crean who made it click into place. Their sensors must be much more advanced than ours, she said in a hushed tone. What do you mean? asked Luna. I spoke up. They were able to tell that our frame was fractured before we were. They were also able to determine our ship's layout to a degree that allowed them to formulate a rescue plan without consulting us. Not only that, but they were able to scan our databases well enough to be able to extrapolate and translate our language. More silent. We hadn't just indebted ourselves in first contact with an unknown alien species. We'd indebted ourselves with a more advanced unknown alien species. I spent the next few minutes wondering what I should wear to my hearing. I took solace in the fact that what's left of my crew might live. We're being hailed, sir, Lena informed me. Open a channel. Lieutenant Babanin sounded more cheerful as he said, we're ready to rescue you. Turns out my plan held up to scrutiny, so we'll be proceeding with it. The only change is that we'll be sending some of our people aboard to assist with the evacuation, and I'll be joining the away team. Once everyone is safely off the ship, the USS Thanatos will scoop it up so we can begin repairs. Even though it was likely a very accurate description of what will happen, something deeply bothered me about the idea of a ship that can crew 50 people being scooped up. Understood, I replied. You have my permission to board. We'll begin evacuation preparation immediately. I'll see you on the bridge. Ulina out. The comms light once again flashed off and the crew gathered around the holographic display in anticipation. We watched as the alien ship expertly maneuvered into a position far enough away that its magnetic fields and gravity wouldn't affect us enough to break us into pieces. We held our breath as the umbilical was fired and slowly traveled the distance between us. There was a time delay of half a second, so we actually heard the ever so soft thud of the umbilical making contact before we saw it. The umbilical has hit its mark and we're holding steady, Crin said joyfully. The tension in the air evaporated as the crew allowed themselves a little celebration. For my part, I exhaled the breath I had been holding in. We're almost safe. Don't celebrate too heartily. We'll be having guests soon and I want everyone on their best behavior. No staring, I said with a smile. Short band signal coming in, sir, Crin said, holding her hand to her ear. It's the lieutenant. He and his team are proceeding through the umbilical. Okay, everyone, respirators on. I want the injured evacuated first, then the non-essentials. Crean, Lena, you'll be evacuating with me, I said with as much authority as I could muster. Yes, sir, the remaining crew said unanimously. Sir, they're aboard. The lieutenant is headed this way, Crin said. I heard the thudding footsteps before I saw what they belonged to. The first one through the door was huge. I was fooled at first because it had to slump through the door, but then it rose to its full height, at least six and five inches, 195 centimeters, and very wide. It was obviously wearing a pressure suit, but the suit looked more like body armor. The helmet was completely opaque, with what looked like lights and cameras installed. There were thick plates 
strategically placed on what looked like a rubbery weaved bodysuit. The bodysuit was black, but everything else was navy blue. We were all staring in a shocked silence when the other two monstrosities crouched through the door. They were both seven, tess, 216 centimeters tall and wearing a similar pressure suit, but in olive drab. Even under such seemingly cumbersome attire, it was obvious that their musculature would put our most avid bodybuilders to shame. I fought my fight or flight instincts as I briefly wondered if they were even organic at all. Air safe, Lieutenant, one of the green monsters said. The one in blue took off his helmet to reveal soft beige skin with golden high-cut hair. His piercing blue eyes scanned the room like a predator before he affixed his gaze to me. His lips curled in what could be mistaken for a snarl, showing four pointed teeth and several flat ones. This actually set me at ease because I recognized the expression as a smile. Several primate species have similar expressions. Even the Urukari have our own variation. You must be Captain uh, Shiphead Ulina, it said. Ye yes, and you must be Lieutenant Babanin. W welcome aboard, I said, trying my best not to stammer. I'm sorry if we look frightening. These are designed to do that, but they're all we had on hand. I understand you're uh, quite larger than we pictured, I said, as I rubbed the back of my neck nervously. One of the green monsters chuckled slightly. The other turned to look at him with what I assume was a glare. The suits add to our size by an inch or two. It doesn't sound like it makes a difference, but it definitely does. He gestured to his left. This is Corporal Simmons. Then he gestured to his right. This is Lance Corporal Johnson. Nice to meet you, Johnson said in a gruff voice. I nodded in acknowledgement, unable to speak. Well then, let's get you rescued, shall we? Lieutenant Babanin said with another smile. I was about to agree when the proximity alert chimed again. This time I definitely recognized the sound. I had been hearing it more and more lately and the last time I heard it was right before we found ourselves in this situation. My heart skipped a beat. Crin looked up from her station and shouted, Sir, Omni Union ships. Subject, Shiphead Ulina. Species, Urukari. Description, reptilian humanoid, no tail. 5, 3 inches, 1.6 M. AVG height, 135 pounds, 61 kilograms. AVG weight, 105 year life expectancy. Ship, RSV Lolana, fights with honor. Location, Sol. Two Omni Union destroyers just entered the system from warp, Crin said with obvious panic in her voice. A lot of thoughts ran through my mind at once. Why were they here? They obviously pursued us, but how? And why? What do we have that they want? The only reason I could think of was that they had followed us to confirm the kill. Will the aliens be able to fight them off? I remembered the gigantic ship that first greeted us. Yes, they'll absolutely be able to destroy the OU ships. The only question was whether they would be able to do so before the ships got us. I trepidatiously watched the holographic display. The destroyers were bearing down on the alien vessel at full speed. Alarms pinged as the OU ships fired their weapons. Weapons fired. OU shields have spooled up. They're advancing. Crin continued her play-by-play. -play. The alien ship had already maneuvered to face them. I watched the missiles travel from the OU to the aliens and bit my tongue nervously. The OU ships began to turn to port and starboard for a broadside, acting in a kind of unison that only they can manage. They were going to be able to fire on all three of our vessels at once, and those broadsides would tear through us like a tissue. Before they got a chance to complete the maneuver, the alien vessel disappeared. It was gone for less than a second before it reappeared between the OU ships and the missiles they had fired. The aliens fired weapons, but the display didn't know what to make of them. It was over in an instant. Both OU destroyers crippled and had a single shot from a ship that was smaller than they were. I watched in awe as they both exploded from reactor meltdowns. The word shocked doesn't even begin to describe my feelings. I just witnessed decades-old war doctrines crumble to dust. Not only were the aliens' weapons advanced enough to punch through the shields and armor of the OU ships, but they had been able to secure kill shots without knowing anything about the enemy. I almost felt relieved until I remembered that these aliens had never fought the OU before. They didn't know the SOP standard operating procedure and how dangerous they were even after being crippled. I turned to the lieutenant. You need to tell your ship to avoid comms contact and stay away from their debris field now, I said, panic seeping into my voice. Lieutenant Babanin looked confused, but nodded and donned his helmet, acknowledged doing so. As Babanin warned his ship, I turned back in time to watch the alien vessel dispatch the missiles with what seemed like point defense lasers. I made eye contact with Kryn and Luna, who were both noticeably paler. 
Crin spoke first, an in-system precision FTL jump followed by immediate weapons fire. And they didn't lose shields even for a second, Lena said with a tremble in his voice. That's a pretty standard maneuver around these parts, Corporal Simmons said from beside me. I couldn't help but to jump a little. He had somehow moved from across the room without me noticing. Something that big shouldn't be able to move like that. It's unnatural. How do you compensate for the solar radiation's effect on the FTL field? Crin asked. I don't know, I'm just a grunt. I don't get paid to think, Simmons said with a laugh. You sure don't Simmons? Babanin interjected. Shiphead Ulina, quick question. What is it? What happens if the USS Valor already made comms contact with the enemy vessels? I didn't even have time to react with horror before the target lock alarm began pinging. I turned back to the display to find the alien vessel pointing directly at us. Then we die, I said. The only sound on the bridge was the droning target lock alarm, as we all made peace with what would surely be our quick demise. I almost cried. We had come so close, and now I was about to die along with all my crew. At least their weapons would ensure we didn't suffer. Much. We all stood together not saying a single word as we awaited certain death. After about a minute, Lance Corporal Johnson cocked his head to the side and said, they should have fired by now. Then the alarm cut off. It took a few seconds to realize that we might not die after all, and I released the breath I hadn't realized I was holding. This was too much. I collapsed in my seat and held my head in my hands. When I looked back up, Lieutenant Babanin appeared to be having a silent conversation with someone. Then he turned to look directly at me. So, the uh, Omni Union, their AI? He asked hesitantly. Yes, I said. Okay, right, hacking. That explains no comms contact, but why avoid the debris field? I stood back up. The bastards booby trapped the hell out of their ships to prevent reverse engineering their technology. Nuclear seeker mines, antimatter mines, hull ripper drones, and even EMP devices are all released once the ships are crippled or destroyed. Roger that. I'll radio it in. Let's get you all to safety. Things were less stressful from there. I oversaw the evacuation of the injured and dead, then the non-essential personnel. Finally, it was time for me to evacuate with the two remaining members of my bridge crew. I sent Crean and Lena on ahead as I took a moment to say goodbye to my ship. The aliens had said that they'd repair it, but you never know. This might be the last time I see it. It's not right for a shiphead to leave their ship without a goodbye. After my moment of emotional indulgence was over, I checked my respirator and briefly considered grabbing my sidearm from my chair. I thought better of it, though. I doubted that I would have any need of it. And even if I did, it wouldn't do anything against the alien's armor anyway. I turned to find that Lieutenant Babanin had stayed behind with me. Let's go, I said. He nodded and led me to the umbilical. It was less structurally sound than I had imagined. It looked like a very long plastic tube with a rope down it. I was confused by this until Lieutenant Babanin stepped inside the tube and began to float. Right. No artificial gravity in the plastic tube in the middle of space. Makes sense. I followed the lieutenant's lead and used the rope to pull myself down the tube. I hate the feeling of weightlessness. Joints popping as they float apart slightly. The tumbling of your stomach. Being unsure of which way was up is a horrible experience, in my opinion. The fact that I was upside down by the time I got to the end of the tube further cemented my disdain. I righted myself and climbed aboard the shuttle. Everyone else had been assigned a seat. I checked on the wounded before finding my own seat. Cran and the others were hanging in there. I let Crin know that her brother was still alive as we departed for the alien frigate. Johnson and Simmons had removed their helmets and were sitting opposite myself and Crin. Johnson was a darker shade of beige than Lieutenant Babanin, but had the same eye color. His hair was dark brown and he had scars along his jaw. They looked like claw marks. Simmons had dark brown skin and black hair. His eyes were yellow. They both had the same close-shaved haircut. So what are your species called? Crean asked. Johnson grinned and said, Well, I'm human, but Simmons here is a shitbag. Fuck you, Simmons said with a laugh. We're both human. The Valor is a human ship, and we were chosen as your rescuers in the point of first contact, because Saul is our home system. So you have other aliens on board the bigger ship? Crean asked with widened eyes. Please forgive her for the questions. She's naturally curious, I said with a hint of exhaustion. It's no problem, Simmons said. But yeah, we do. You've got the Alamari, which are bug people. Then you've got the Nuknas, which are bird people. And you've got the Gaunts, which are like bear centaurs, but with paws instead of hooves. What's a centaur? Johnson laughed and added, a centaur is a mythical beast that is half human and half horse. You probably don't know what a horse is either, but that's okay. Gaunts have four legs and two arms. The legs have paws instead of feet but the arms have hands kind of like our own. 
You'll probably end up meeting one or two once we get back to the USS Thanatos. Our engineering staff is mostly gaunt. Got it. So let me ask you something. Why are your weapons so advanced? How were you able to kill those two ships with one salvo? How did you counteract the AI's hacking? It isn't just your ship's weapons either, is it? Those suits you're wearing. I noticed the shimmer. Crin was nearly salivating as she asked this. Johnson and Simmons looked at each other. They seemed to decide that Simmons should answer. Well, we don't really know how advanced our weapons are compared to yours. And I'm not really sure how much I'm allowed to tell you about our tech. As far as how we advanced the way we did, well, I'm sure the brass would rather give you a spit-polished version of our history. I found myself curious, though. What's the shimmer you're talking about, Crin? I think, um, I think they have portable energy shields on those suits, she said as she looked at the humans and back to me. Simmons smiled with all his teeth and tapped his nose. Got it in one. You're pretty clever, lizard lady. I knew it wasn't meant to be offensive, but Crean couldn't help but click her mouth in distaste. Lizards are a type of reptile, as are we, but we are not lizards. We don't even have tails. Johnson picked up on the offense and elbowed Simmons. Ah, oh, shit, my bad. SR has been working with me on that. Won't happen again, ma'am, the corporal apologized. What's SR? Crean asked, having already forgotten the offense. Sapient relations. Their job is to make sure that we get along with the other species, Simmons answered sheepishly. Yeah, Simmons is their biggest job. He's lucky he hasn't been busted down for it yet, Johnson said with a smirk. Give him time, though. He'll be a private again soon. Fuck you with a stick, Johnson. That's enough, you two, Lieutenant Bavanin interrupted. We're initiating docking procedures. Make sure everyone's secure. He glanced back at me from the cockpit. Shiphead, you're going to be debriefed by the captain once we're aboard. We will need to know everything you know about the Omni Union. Understood, I said, swallowing nervously. Even though they were friendly enough, these humans were damned intimidating.